She's an elegant ocean liner with a storied past. My first ship and will be the best memory of my life. Iron Lady of the Seas for half a century. It's an old ship, but still strong and still can run fast. Hard to pour. Marco Polo navigates modern marvels. 65 meters from the sea level. En route to ancient history. That's so gorgeous. As a brand new captain wrestles with her quirks. Hard to starboard. On a thrill ride into adventure. When were the god? <laughs> Cruise ship Marco Polo is a model of maritime history. Her classic outline recalls the heyday of the Grand Ocean Liners. She was launched back in 1965, a luxury ship built for the hardline regime of the old Soviet Union. Deluxe, yes, but this vessel is also designed for extra stability, with a reinforced hull to plow through broken ice on Arctic routes. She may be nearly 50 years old, but this Grand Dame is built to last. It's still classic. It's the old ocean liner, and I'm glad to be here. Captain Nectarius Rigas is just learning how to handle this 22,000-ton ship. You must have some, I can say, extra skills. He's a fourth-generation captain who cut his teeth on the massive ferries that thread among the Greek islands. But he's just taken command of Marco Polo, and this will be his first time taking her to the Baltics. Just see me when I maneuver the ship. Marco Polo is tied up at the British port of Tilbury on the Thames River, 40 kilometers southeast of London. Tilbury is London's original cruise port, dating from the 1880s. It's a perfect departure point for this historic ship to sail out on an historic route. Marco Polo is going on a 12-night round-trip voyage into the Baltic Sea, first to Copenhagen, then Germany, then visiting the grand old cities of Tallinn, Estonia and St. Petersburg. On the return, she'll stop in Finland and Sweden, then pass from the Baltic to the North Sea through Germany's Kiel Canal. It's a sold-out 5,700-kilometer cruise for 800 travelers. So two tickets for Stockholm on your own. It's because you go to shore in tenders that day. Passengers know they're not boarding an amusement park at sea. They've chosen this ship for a taste of the real Baltics without the summer crowds. Getting people booked on the right tours, that is the most challenging part. That day is the only day, it's a little bit different. So you... Susan McKinley says out-of-season travel offers rewards and challenges. And in our presentations, we always say, wear everything. Hat, scarf, barbaclava, flip-flops, because you never know what the weather's going to do in St. Petersburg. Just making our final checks and ready to depart. Passengers are spending between $1,500 and $3,000 for this late autumn cruise, just when harsher weather is around the corner. Almost every other cruise ship has already left these waters. All the cruise ships remove somewhere else, to Caribbean or in Asia. We are the only ship in Baltic Sea. But as you see, we are full of passengers. That means the passengers, they love it. They want to see the adventure. It's 1.30 p.m. now, and in two hours, the tide will be in, high enough to float Marco Polo's deep hull. But this cruise isn't putting to sea just yet. Svetlana, Svetlana, Hotel Director. Hotel Director Patrick Visser has a royal headache. A major traffic accident has blocked the road leading to the port. A dozen passengers and crew members are stranded, and that means Marco Polo's departure is delayed. Five, seven passengers, three. How many crew? I would have to double check that. I'll give you a call in two minutes. Delay the passengers, delay the mooring men, delay the pilot, delay the tugboat. Everything is delayed. Five, five. 
There's nothing Patrick can do but wait. We're going to continue the operation as normal, as it should be. And uh, for the moment, that is the status. 230,000 vessels travel along the busy Thames River every year. For Polo, London BTS, the first of the inbound traffic is the Pluto. So up in the Tilbury Control Tower, rule number one is keep the traffic flowing. But right now, Marco Polo is messing up their schedule. Forward Tower, we have approximately 15 minutes delay. We are still waiting for our crew members. I cannot wait anymore. Otherwise, we'll be too late and uh, the wind is coming up. If Marco Polo lingers much longer, she could jam up traffic. She's 8.1 meters draft out for Copenhagen by the sunk with 1092. <laughs> A bit of an ordeal. <laughs> Finally, just before the gangway is removed, everybody makes it on board. Go ahead, welcome aboard. Passenger Thank you very much. With local pilot Don Cockrell on the bridge, Marco Polo is good to go. What have you got traffic-wise at the moment, Bernie? Marco Polo, at this time, there is no conflict in traffic for you. All clear. Over. Marco Polo is a half hour late for her scheduled 3.30 departure. But time is not the only thing that's tight. A car carrier has wedged right in front of the ship so she can't sail straight out. Forward. Yes, forward, go ahead. Captain Rigas and Staff Captain Vyacheslav Kalishnikov can barely edge their ship away from the berth, moving just a meter at a time. Forward, our station can stop all lines. Hard to stop. Hard to start work. The Thames is always a tricky river to navigate with strong currents. When you can see your way round, uh, come round the other side. Today, the pilot has ordered not one, but two tugs to deal with rapidly shifting winds. The harbour master to say that if the wind was over 15 knots from any direction, then the ship should take two tugs. Captain Regus is not impressed. Each tug costs 5,000 pounds, about $8,000. Yes, but now that you see it was only seven knots. No, 17. 17 knots. It was not 17, anyway. 17 knots. Things just get worse when one tug pulls too hard and breaks the reinforced ring for the towing line. This is what happens when other people touch my ship. We don't need that boat, I told him. But Captain Regus has greater concerns on his mind. We have, uh, in this period, because it's winter now, a lot of storms, rough seas, strong winds, narrow passage. So this is the challenge for me now. As Marco Polo heads out into the North Sea, the captain braces himself for those challenges. It's day two of ocean liner Marco Polo's trip to the historic Baltic region. She's crossing over the top of Denmark on her way to the place where the North Sea meets up with the unpredictable waters of the Baltic. While the temperature is in his favor, around 13 degrees Celsius, welder Alexander Poltaratsky rushes to fix this reinforced ring for the tow ropes. A tugboat damaged the ring at departure. They'll need this again when they tie up in Copenhagen tomorrow. That means grinding away the old paint, fixing any cracks, and welding it. It's a tight fit, but after the seam is reinforced, the crew can shimmy it back into place. 182, please. One at two, thank you. Yes, please. Every time is exciting because every departure is different. This is the first paid posting for Officer Cadet Georgian Enash since graduating from the Romanian Naval Academy. The way he sees it, this ship is ageless. I don't know what means a new ship. For me, this is new and old in the same time because I don't know. It's my, my first time on sea. Georgian's not the only one excited to be here. 
Passenger Roy Maunder is making his seventh cruise on Marco Polo. When I first came on the ship, it was seemed so familiar. Roy is a former marine engineer who fell in love with cruising as a child. I remember when I first joined my first cruise line when I was about nine. It was a ship very much like this one. And it just, I don't know, pulled at my heartstrings. I thought, this is going to be fun. And I still have that sense of fun when I'm on it. Roy checks out some old postcards that date back to Marco Polo's first life. In 1965, she was launched as the Soviet ocean liner Alexander Pushkin. When I look at a ship that I want to travel on, I want it to look like a ship. And these are beautiful. I mean, this, this, this is an original one uh, from the Alexander Pushkin. And I can see some of the style of this ship is just like it was when it was really built. Most cruise ships are out of service by their 30th year. But over the decades, this classic liner has undergone a couple of facelifts to improve her looks and extend her life. The latest makeover in 1991 removed the pool solarium to create a series of open terraces with a new top deck behind a reworked smokestack. 100 rooms were added to the middle and stern. Two years and $60 million later, the ship was reborn as the sleeker ocean liner Marco Polo. But two key components remain from the original the reinforced hull and the pair of 10,000 horsepower engines that propel the ship. I know these engines and they're re really like sewing machines. They just run on and on and on, totally reliable. Polo's engines power her through the seas at a top speed of 17 and a half knots or 32 kilometers per hour. But those half century old engines require special care. That's the job of chief engineer Ion Rizia. Still working properly because we maintain properly in a good way. Today's job is preparation for a piston overhaul in the two main engines. One time per year, each piston must be uh, overhauled. The only window of time to complete the job is the two-day stop in St. Petersburg, when the engines can be shut down. Right now, they're gathering all the replacement parts they may need. As the morning dawns on day three of Marco Polo's voyage, she begins her approach to Copenhagen, Denmark. For the passengers, it's a first glimpse at Baltic history, including Kronberg Castle, the inspiration for Hamlet's infamous Elsinore. For the captain, Nectarius Rigas, there's no sightseeing. It's a busy harbor to navigate. Ja, men vi er cirka 25 minutter fra Molerne. Kan du bekræfte over, vi skal ikke på lange linje? Local pilot Michael de Trindade briefs Captain Rigas on the entry into Copenhagen. Let's swing around and let's come up, line it up here. Is and there the is a little bit wind setting off, but very not much. 7.8, forward. There will be no tugboats to guide Marco Polo in or out of this port. So the pilot suggests a bit of parallel parking is in order. We will enter the port. Come a little bit further inside, and eventually we will make a, a, a starboard swing, using both the twisting of the engines and using the bow twister. Captain Rigas navigates that pirouette of the ship at just under three knots. It's going to be a little bit slow, but it's a nice maneuver, and at the same time, it will be much easier for departure. Hard to starboard. Finally, the captain delicately backs up his 176-meter-long ship until she's perfectly aligned in her berth. It's a whirlwind five-and-a-half-hour stop here, so the gangway swiftly down and passengers file off for sightseeing in Copenhagen.
by 6 p.m., everyone's back on board and the gangway is pulled in for departure. Next stop, Warnemunde, Germany, the gateway to Berlin. We are clear from the corner, very good. The quickest route would be to sail directly south through the Orison Strait that runs between Denmark and Sweden. But there's a catch. Marco Polo was built with the draft of a modern cruise ship five times her size. Her hull plunges 8.2 meters below the waterline. That cuts down on pitching and rolling when the waves and swells are high, making for a smoother ride. But the Orison Strait is too shallow to accommodate her draft. It's only eight meters deep. Sail through there and Marco Polo is sure to run aground. So the only option is to retrace part of the route north, then loop south through the Great Belt Strait to get to Germany. That means the double time. And double fuel also, but there is no choice. Backtracking adds another 370 kilometers to the journey. But early on the fourth day, Marco Polo eases into her berth in Varnamunda. Within an hour of arrival, the ship is pretty much emptied of guests. They're off for a full day tour of Berlin, three hours away by bus. Out on the pier, provisioning is underway. Nothing comes on to Marco Polo without the watchful scrutiny of head storekeeper Dimitar Georgiev. This is actually a pretty complicated procedure. It all depends on this electric platform that transfers goods from the dock to the hold of the ship. The platform has a capacity of four tons. Once it's been packed, a single cab operator takes over moving the platform inside the ship. Then it's lowered down to receiving deck number three, where the goods are unloaded. As you can see in this moment, the guys are working on both sides of the platform. One line from that side, one line from this side, in order to make it faster. Like the engines that still power Marco Polo, this platform is also an original holdover from the 1960s. The platform is actually a pretty sophisticated uh, piece of equipment for such an old ship. It's an old lady, you know that, it's 50 years old, but it's very useful. Once on board, the supplies fly down a chute, where a receiving line on deck number two passes them along to storage. Pretty fast. That's how we do the loading. We have to be on time, because the ship has to sail on schedule, sharp, no delays. But later that night, there's a big delay when assistant excursions manager Susan McKinley finds herself alone on the pier. What's the traffic like? Who can tell what the traffic's like? And that's exactly what's happened in Berlin today. Missing in action, two buses with nearly 100 passengers returning from Berlin. Marco Polo was supposed to set sail half an hour ago, but she can't go anywhere until those guests are back aboard. Captain could be on the bridge jumping up and down going, Susan, where are my passengers? It's 10.30 p.m. in Varnemunde, Germany, on day four of Marco Polo's Baltic Sea cruise. Her crew is anxious. She's a half hour late for departure. Staff Captain Vyacheslav Kaleshnikov scans nearby roads for two missing tour buses, returning passengers from Berlin. Though she's responsible for the missing guests, Susan McKinley keeps her game face on. I'm just waiting for them to come back, make sure they're okay, make sure they get their midnight snack, and that's what they'll be waiting for. <laughs> Seconds later, nearly 100 passengers make their belated appearance. Welcome home. Remember the bistro's open for your soup and everything sandwiches? Okay, let's go. Car to port. The captain doesn't waste any time leaving. 
Mr. Pilot? 12 knots. Okay. Captain Regus calls on Marco Polo's powerful diesel engines to swiftly bring the ship up to 16 knots. In just 34 hours, the liner is scheduled to dock at the medieval city of Tallinn, Estonia. Captain Regus needs to make up for lost time. Let's cut it in very fine shedding, yeah? A day at sea with everyone aboard means extra work for Marco Polo's galley crew. The one person who must really step up to the plate is executive chef Bashir Vedekal. The things I'm making for now is uh, one of the very popular dish in our menu is uh, chicken butter masala. It's a uh, medium spicy. It's a turmeric powder. It's a coriander powder. It's a garam masala powder, chili powder, whole red chili, and ginger, and vegetable oil, and fresh cream. Do this one first. Chef Vedical is boss to a galley staff of 60. When not in port, three shifts work around the clock to please the taste buds of the guests. It's a huge kitchen. It's very difficult, but we are managing to ready for the 800 people to serve. The soup is a cream of three piece soup. But the chef's toughest critic is hotel director Patrick Visser. What's good today? Lamb curry, yeah. the biryani rice, and the raita, and the papadam. Okay. And so the pork belly with the gravy, and the mashed potato, and cold vegetables. Gravy? The galley services both the Waldorf, the main formal restaurant, and Marco's Bistro, a casual buffet area at the stern. You have to take into account that on this ship, we're making an average of uh, 2,400 covers per day which is representing on a cruise uh, like this one, close to 25,000 covers in the whole time. And if you think this team is cooking with gas, think again. In the galley, I cannot cook for a pop and fly, because it's for the safety issue. Instead, two auxiliary boilers in the engine room redirect steam to the stoves through a single line. This is the old cooking method ocean liners used to employ, and highly efficient. For example, it takes only one minute to boil up to 200 liters of broth for the chef's daily special. Marco Polo is tied up at the pier in Tallinn, Estonia, on day six of her Baltic cruise. Oh, I'm coming with you today. Hi, good morning. The medieval town is set to be a highlight of the cruise. Oh, my darling. <laughs> what are you doing? The car? The weather for this time of the year is great. I always bring up the deer. This is where my sheepdog skills come in handy. Susan McKinley, eager to show off Talon, shepherds her passengers off the buses. The onion dome churches, the large towers, the beautiful turrets and spikes. It's medieval town here. But it's like when you see the Walt Disney movies, it's based on Talon. It's got a bit of a special little thing in my heart as well, Talon. It's beautiful. Being the only cruise ship in town has its advantages. You're going to get the real life of Talon in Estonia without, could you imagine another 10 cruise ships here? You couldn't stand in this park without it being thronged with people. That's a special bit coming at this time and that's why we do it. But the unpredictable winds of early winter change are moving in on this journey. It's time for Marco Polo to haul anchor. She has to make it to Russia in just 14 hours. It's a destination that will keep both the passengers and the crew hopping. Well, this, this, this ship has been absolutely lovely. I thoroughly enjoyed the journey so far. It's 4.30 in the morning, and the lights of St. Petersburg appear oh so close. But the crew of Marco Polo still faces a tricky three-hour navigation. So the lights are dimmed on the bridge as they watch out for channel markers. It's a very narrow passage. We have to stay in the middle because outside of the boys it's shallow water. 
Captain Regas faces some tight 90 degree turns. But there's less than 40 meters to play with on either side of his ship as she moves through the buoys. If we go outside, we'll ground. And if that's not enough of a challenge, the pilot hasn't shown up. Ah, disaster. Captain Regas has never taken Marco Polo through this treacherous passage before. And it looks like he'll have to go it alone. Try to keep in the middle. The current is one mile against us. Very early on day seven of her Baltic voyage, Captain Regas is steering Marco Polo through a narrow passage on the entry to St. Petersburg, Russia. She's less than a kilometer from the pier. You see between these buoys, the red, the, the green one, it's only 100 meters, the width. There are very shallow waters on either side of the passage. One wrong move and the ship could run aground. We cross the gate and stop the engines. But the captain has been forced to navigate mostly on his own. The local pilot has only just turned up. Okay, stop the engines. And now there's another obstacle. Several small freighters have right of way over the cruise ship. That's slow. That's slow. It is that slow. It is that slow. There are only three meters of clearance between the bottom of the ship and the seabed below. Captain Regis is anxious to avoid a situation every sailor fears, the squad effect. Look at this. This is a squad. Yeah. More speed, more squad. More speed, That's more when a squad. ship moves too fast in shallow seas, causing her hull to sink lower and risk scraping bottom. That's not going to happen on this captain's watch. So he proceeds really slowly, down to a crawl, barely moving. Until he finally reaches the dock. A busy day. Okay. Find radio, clipboard, bag, everything. It's time to go. This is when the voyage switches into high gear for Susan McKinley. Let's go, yeah, let's go. Okay then, so your coaches are just all over here. St. Petersburg is a challenge because out of 750 odd guests, nobody can go ashore unless they've got a private visa. Russian paperwork sure slows things down, but it's no match for Susan's enthusiasm. We have over 32 coaches today. The weather's not that great, but who knows? We'll have a fantastic time. It's just a fantastic day. Okay, <laughs> see ya. Down in the engine room, the clock starts now. Crew members like Dimitrov Kazpov have just 36 hours to overhaul two pistons in the main engines. Chief engineer Ion Ritzia depends on these experienced team members. Yes, yeah, the major maintenance, and we will we will use around uh, six person because we have to finish to put main engine in standby as soon as possible. The maintenance can only happen when the main engines are shut down. So the dirty job must be finished before Marco Polo powers up for tomorrow's departure. You cannot stay with the engine out of order for so long time. The crew works on two separate levels. First, on the upper engine room deck, the cylinder head is removed. Then the one-ton piston is moved up and away for cleaning. One deck down, Volodymyr Shamak releases the lower piston housing. Meanwhile, back upstairs, the cylinder head gets a good grinding to remove carbon deposits. And uh, when we finish, I'll go inside to see how uh, how it looks. Huh? No. Okay. It's a filthy task. But someone's got to climb inside the cylinder and remove the buildup. There's no downtime for the engineering department in St. Petersburg. Marco Polo is also taking on 950 tons of fuel. That's enough to gas up 8,000 automobiles. We do here because of uh, good balance between price and uh, quality. It's 
still a hefty bill. Around $650,000 for a fill-up that takes at least 10 hours. But it will last a full 30 days at sea. Marco Polo is spending a second day in the port of St. Petersburg. The weather has turned gray and foggy. While the passengers are out on their final tours, crew members prepare their vessel for rougher weather. Back in the engine room, down in the piston cylinder, the chief engineer does a visual inspection of the rotary valves after the cleaning. I'm looking here for some deformation. I mean, physical deformation. But it uh, looks okay. okay. Yeah, we do. There's a thorough check of the seal of the cylinder head for any remaining carbon yes, deposits. Yes. A little bit more here, huh? Yes. Yeah. The piston is moved into position and a final coat of lubricant applied before it's lowered down the shaft. And one deck down, the one-ton piston is reconnected. This is the crucial point of the entire operation. A bit of old-fashioned elbow grease secures the bolts so they don't fly off and smash through the engine system. Okay, we have to pay very big attention to this because uh, if we don't tie very well, it can create a big damage to the engine. The two overhauled pistons are ready for work. With a tension like this, they'll run smoothly for another three years. And the main engines can now be restarted. Closing. Out on the exterior bridge wings, Captain Rigas and Staff Captain Kalashnikov are edging Marco Polo out from her berth. Two and a half. Two and a half closing. Okay. closing. Okay, good closing. It won't be easy. The local port authority assigned a tight corner berth to Marco Polo, so she has barely any space to turn. Good, we are on the first attempt is a bust. Okay, let's try from the beginning. Okay, I'll do something else. We go back and I will try from the other side. Yes, 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 yes. Marco Polo was built for stately movements, not tricky maneuvers. And the engineers down in the control room must be on high alert to respond instantly to the commands. Car to starboard. That ringing bell marks every command from the captain on the bridge. Sliding from the fender. But we are closing to the bollard. Captain, we are closing here to the bollard. We are touching the construction of the pier here. The cruise ship swings dangerously close to the dock. Half to port, half to starboard. Closing. Half meter of the fender, distance now to the pier. Half to starboard. If the captain doesn't pay strict attention, Marco Polo could slam into the pier. He's slowly opening, swinging clear now. Four meters, swinging clear, very good. Very good, very good. It's okay, it's okay. We'll pass clear from the dredger. Collision avoided. The bridge crew manages to squeeze their 22,000 ton vessel out from the pier and away from the path of another vessel. Now it's lights out as they gear up to navigate through some really thick pea soup. I'm expecting a lot of fog today. So don't be afraid if I use the blast the whole night, the fog blast. Marco Polo is sailing straight into some epic weather. After sailing all night through heavy fog from St. Petersburg, Marco Polo is tied up at the dock in Helsinki. Passengers return from a day on the town and everything appears to be going according to schedule. But Captain Regus knows this is the calm before the storm. 
He's already thinking about the next stop in Sweden. The weather forecast tells him something nasty is brewing up ahead. The wind is increasing. And the problem is the next port. Tomorrow we're expecting 50 knots, 5-0. It's gonna be rough. Steady! Steady as she goes. As Marco Polo hauls anchor and heads out of Helsinki, the captain confides his weather concerns to local pilot Marty Soigno. With, with the bad weather. I have the information that is uh, eight and a half meters away yes. outside. The yeah, northern Baltic can be really bad. Yeah. We are talking about hurricane now. But pilot Soigno has faith in Marco Polo. He's guided her many times. She's like a classic. She's very good at rough sea and windy weather. This is exactly what her deep draft was designed for, steadying Marco Polo as she plows through pounding waves. 16 knots? 16 is okay. Uh, uh, full maneuver expense is 14 and a half. Okay, then we go that. We do okay. That. And down below, those 50-year-old engines kick into overdrive. The only way to go uh, to reach the port of Tilbury without delay is to go ahead with full speed. Marco Polo is an old ship, but still strong and uh, he still can run fast. As night begins to fall around Marco Polo, the winds build. With gusts already up to 30 knots, or 55 kilometers per hour, the crew rushes to lash down the ship. On the two lowest passenger decks, sailors secure the glass portholes. In rough seas, passenger safety is priority one for every single crew member. The final stop on this voyage is Nynasham, Sweden, the access port to Stockholm. Following that, Marco Polo has a planned shortcut through the Kiel Canal, which connects the Baltic Sea to the North Sea. It's the busiest man-made waterway in the world and will save the cruise ship 460 kilometers on her return to Tilbury. <laughs> But now, there's bad news about that time-saving route home. We have a problem with Kiel Canal. It's blocked. Two cargo vessels have collided in the Kiel Canal, and it's been closed to traffic. Even if it reopens in time for Marco Polo to make her passage, she won't be able to sail through right away. Also, there is another risk, because it's a big line of ships now. They are waiting, more than 20 ships. Marco Polo cannot afford to sit in a lineup, waiting hours or days to transit the canal. On the other hand, the only other route back would take them over the top of Denmark, but that would add a full day to the trip home. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain speaking from the bridge. After weighing his options, the captain announces his plans. The collision of two vessels. We have reluctantly taken the decision to cancel our scheduled call to Nina Sam Sweden. He's dropping the final port of call, buying enough time to sail the longer route home and avoiding the Kiel Canal altogether. It's the only way he's going to make it back to Tilbury on time. This false major situation is very much beyond our control. Yeah, you've got to think on your feet sometimes. Does he want this back, Mark? Every member of the crew is affected by the change in plans. Susan McKinley is busy refunding passengers for missed shore excursions. It's just one of those things that happens at sea, unfortunately. Wind, weather, God. <laughs> Go on, Pam, that just needs a nudge. There it is. In the lounge area, it's up to cruise director Matt Dallin to find a silver lining in the stormy sea days ahead. You've got nearly 800 passengers that are expected to go ashore and do all their excursions. It may have been the place that they really wanted to see. Um, 
works. So for me, I have to make that, um, turn that round, turn it round so everybody enjoys themselves. Right now, though, everybody has to get through the night. At three o'clock in the morning, the storm hits with full fury. I'm steering. So as I see, the wind is more than 55 knots, and we are running very fast. We have to reduce the speed, otherwise we'll damage the ship. Yes, good evening. Hello, Captain speaking. Let's go to 87 and we'll see. OK, yeah, thank you. Good. For now, it's too windy. It's lockdown time. All the exits, the gangways, and all the gates. Marco Polo is running through the very center of the storm. As morning breaks on the Baltic Sea, Marco Polo has passed through the worst of the storm. Cruise director Matt Dallin heads to the bridge to deliver a weather report to the passengers. Just to let you know, last night the winds were blowing over 50 knots, which is force 10 in the Beaufort scale. That goes up to force 12, and we had a force 10 last night. Not surprisingly, the breakfast buffet is looking pretty empty. Reaction to the experience is a mixed bag among the passengers. It felt like almost as if we'd hit something and the, the boat shuddered and then suddenly all everything off our table would uh, crash onto the floor, bottles, glasses and... Oh, it was absolutely terrible. I didn't sleep a wink last night at all. It was absolutely awful. It was absolutely great. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I kept looking out of the window all night long. The spray was going past, the waves were crashing on and we were up and down. The wardrobe doors were flying open, the drawers were coming open and it was great. The, the captain and staff captain check out Marco Polo to see how she's weathered the storm. Any maintenance for the port? Yes, just the last, last port where, you know, the repainting, the all the prints, yeah. It was uh, not the biggest, but uh, one of the biggest storms in my career. So the ship was reacting perfectly. We had no damages at all. That's what makes this Iron Lady special. But there are still two days at sea before they reach the home port of Tilbury. And 800 passengers for Matt to keep entertained. So we're just on our way to Captain's Club. Uh, obviously the change of itinerary, change of plan. I'm gonna go and do uh, some quizzes, jackalope, beanbag bowls, and hopefully uh, lights, camera action. Did you survive the night? Uh, no, I've got it out, I'm very good. What's going on with the weather? Because it's now beautiful sunshine. We can't predict anything. Which musical instrument? There is one final treat in store on this voyage. Thanks to her revised route, Marco Polo is going to make a spectacular daytime pass beneath the Great Belt Bridge, which connects the Danish islands of Funen and Zealand. The eastern section is the third longest suspension bridge in the world. 30,000 vehicles cross the seven kilometers from one side to the other every day. The height of the bridge is 65 meters from the sea level. But since her mass tops out at 48 meters, Marco Polo has just the right amount of clearance. It's a picture-perfect finale to a voyage filled with unforgettable experiences. It's been good for a Baltic cruise. It has gone well. I keep my fingers crossed at that one. <laughs> for cadet officer Georgian Enash, Marco Polo has offered up a major life lesson. It's my first ship and will be the best memory of my life, of course. As she heads back to her home port of Tilbury, even the captain admits this cruise has been one for the books. In the cruise, we have to pay a visit to the beautiful ports. We, have, we must have a relaxing days at sea. 
but also it's very interesting if, if we have a piece of adventure. That's what we had two days ago. She's been sailing for half a century, but there's still a lifetime of adventure awaiting Marco Polo on the open seas.